language that you're using um, in the Anishinaabe. Um, it's also important to know that the Mississaugas, um, as well as Anishinaabe people, didn't stay in one place. They actually moved with, with the seasons, they moved with um, what their jobs were at that time, whether it was gathering or hunting or fishing or, or um, gatherings of other nations and welcoming other nations. And so they were named the Mississaugas by the Jesuit settlers and Jesuit missionaries that encountered them at the mouth of the Mississippi River at the, um, where it opens up into Lake Huron. And so that's how they were named. And when they came back to this territory, um, they were placed in situations by the Crown and by the original settlers to this territory, whether it was where, uh, on the shores of Rice Lake, where Hiawatha is and where Alderville is, or to that small peninsula on Mud Lake that, that was later called Curve Lake or St. John. So it's important in Scugong Island. So those were places that the Mississaugas of this territory were placed. It's not their original territory aren't those small parcels of land. And so we need to acknowledge that this entire territory is Mississauga territory, from the north shores of Lake Ontario all the way to the mouth of Lake Huron and every place in between. And they're the stewards of this land, and they're the ones that have taken care of it. And it's for this reason that we acknowledge them, because look how beautiful it is here. Look how beautiful the forests are. They are beautiful. And it's been the, the, the Mississaugas have taken their responsibility seriously, even when we have not as settlers to this territory. So thank you for inviting me to acknowledge this territory, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to say chimi much to the Mississauga people, that I can bring my family here, and that I can raise my son here.
but we are actually considering having a student research project to be able to sort of look into this history. Um, these bylaws are significant because of regardless of how long they've been, they were enforced, legally or otherwise, the history of these bylaws, as well as the fact that, uh, as well as Peterborough's colonial history, creates a culture of acceptance around racism and colonial attitudes and discriminatory practices. Um, many of us know that Peterborough is continuously listed as having one of the highest per capita uh, rates of police reported hate crimes in Canada. Uh, Ontario has consistently uh, the problems with the highest reported rates, and in the last five years, Peterborough has been at the top in the top five. Uh, before the panel, I spoke with the community liaison of the Peterborough Police, who was able to provide me with some numbers of reported hate crimes in the city of Peterborough in 2015. And last year, there were 27 reported hate bias incidents, or they call them hate bias incidents. Uh, of the 27, 22 were either religious or race based. And of those 27, 11 of them. Uh, I've been told them very loud, so maybe I'll just go without the mic. So then of the 27, uh, 11 of those met the criminal threshold for charges to be laid. Um, because CRC provides advocacy services, we also have sort of an informal record of racial and colonial violences that have been reported to us. Um, I spent some time going over our um, records of these for the past five years or so, and some of the trends I was able to identify is that, you know, none of these would be surprising, racial profiling exists in Peterborough. Discrimination in the workplace, including hiring, promotion, and general feelings of welcoming these spaces, exists in Peterborough. Discrimination when accessing services, including not being able to access services, or the services being provided differently when they're accessed by a person of color or indigenous person, exists in Peterborough. Harassment, including anonymous or by people that the individual knows, happens in Peterborough. And feelings of not being welcomed or safe in a space due to imagery, words, or history of the space also exists in Peterborough. Physical violence due to race exists in Peterborough. Bullying at schools. Uh, and in case, some cases, um, the incidents, although they weren't necessarily racialized, um, some members of the community sought out CRC uh, due to anticipating racism if they tried to address the issues through other avenues. Um, we are providing this information to give a brief glance uh, into the recording of racialized and colonial barriers to inclusion, um, but also to highlight the limitations of relying on statistical and reported data to understand the impacts of racism and colonialism in our communities. Many people will share their um, so as I said, um, part of me sharing this is so we can talk about and think about the limitations of this data. Um, many people will share their experiences of why they didn't seek out formal reporting processes, and those experiences are just as important as the ones that were recorded. Um, current mechanisms to reporting have their own limitations, whether they be that an individual or community's relationship with the avenue, whether that be the police or their relationship with a particular nonprofit, or the fact that many of these avenues place definitions on these acts of violence. Um, and that's sort of highlighted in the fact that of the 27 reported, only 11 met the criminal threshold because they didn't meet the definition of a, of a hate crime. Um, Sorry, um, and the result of that is that many of these experiences of violence go unrecognized, unrecorded, and ultimately unaddressed in our community. This is why opportunities like this, to listen, to respect, the strength it takes to participate in a public event like this, sharing our sorrows and triumphs, um, is so important. And I really do, I want to say that I respect so much all of you coming here to speak, and I think it's really important, and I hope that we all leave really with that respect for you guys coming to share your words. Um, yeah, so anyway, without further ado, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for the evening. Uh, Charmaine Mugambe is known to many of us here tonight because she has her hands in so many great things in the Peterborough community. And CRC is tremendously fortunate to have her chair our organization's board. So please join me in welcoming Charmaine, who will lead us into the remainder of the evening. to have this opportunity to moderate. 
Um, I just want to bring to your attention that, that of course, here at Bebrook, we had um, given up the, you could call it the red uh, rural treatment, the one coming out to our latest uh, newcomer of immigrants, the Syrian refugees. Um, we had um, Professor um, Kamel uh, Al Soli. Um, he's a professor at Ryerson University. He recently he recently wrote an article in the Wallace um, called uh, "Suffering Second Hat: Feeling Good Stories About New Refugees Mask the Struggles That Lie Ahead." And in that article, it talks about um, focusing more on the Canadian experience of welcoming refugees, um, more of uh, what Canadians are doing to helping the refugees uh, sort of thing, um, having like um, those photo ops that you see of the, the Prime Minister uh, greeting the, uh, the new refugees of the Premier, or, um, Premier Kathleen Wynne um, at the airport greeting um, the new refugees. And, and in the article it just talks, to, uh, talks about more of what we as Canadians are doing to help and not really hearing what the Syrian refugees have suffered to get here to Canada. <coughs> and in the same way here in Hebrew, uh, we've done the same thing. Uh, as far as welcoming our refugees, we had a really good response. Uh, the New Canadian Centre just recently had a big um, town hall meeting where there was like at least, I think, 350 volunteers here in Peterborough coming and saying that they definitely want to help. And, and welcome the refugees. Um, the impression is uh, that Peterborough, um, just looking at uh, something like that, is a welcoming place that we want the Syrian refugees, we want others, and we want newcomers. Um, but are we really that welcoming? Spoiler alert, not. <laughs> After the welcome mat is rolled out, then what? Um, after the, the photo, uh, photo ops um, giving us stuff, then what? Um, the reality sets in. What happens to people who come here who are considered others? Um, how do they continue to stay here for, for permanently? Just looking at the statistics, we can know that people is not a welcoming place for people who are others. Looking around this room, you can see statistically, it is, Peterborough is a very white town. Okay. Now, uh, just saying that, um, how, what percentage do you think, from Statistics Canada, <coughs> what percentage do you think of a white population this year in Peterborough? Yeah, it's it's ninety five percent. Yeah. Well, like the greatest one, depending what uh, what year you're looking at, from like ninety four to ninety six. So ninety five, we'll just kind of in the middle. So it's uh, it's ninety five. And what percent do you think are considered visible minority in Peterborough? It's about three point six percent. Like don't start adding up numbers. <laughs> Population. 
And so, um, and then about 20 something percent of visible minority. So looking at those statistics alone, like you can see something is wrong with Peterborough. In fact, when I was looking at the statistics, Peterborough was like uh, the top, definitely the top five, five whitest community they're in is in Canada and definitely in Ontario. So that means um, something is not, something is, is wrong, obviously, if we have such a high population of just um, all, all whites and um, what are we doing wrong? This forum is giving an opportunity for our panelists to share their stories as to um, what um, their barriers uh, for inclusion in Peterborough. And that's why we're here to discuss what kind of barrier, why is it that uh, when uh, new people come, others and new immigrants or refugees, they stay for maybe a year or two and then they leave, you know, what is it? Why are we not truly welcoming our, our people who are our minorities? So we're going to start with um, Carmela Avelis, who is going to be um, sharing us a, a little bit about um, immigration. Um, she runs um, Carmela Avelis um, Immigration Consulting, and uh, she was pre previously the executive, the executive director of the New Canadian Centre for nine years. Uh, she's also been um, involved in the Peterborough Immigration Partnership, as well as many community initiatives. So without further, further ado, Permanent 
Brazilian category is the one that is like right in the middle and composed the biggest chunk of um, that composed the, 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 the different the three main categories of, of um, immigration. So the permanent resident um, admissions every year, Immigration Canada sets a target. And every year it has been, and I think in the last 10 years, I would say, been about quarter million admissions. And in the 250 or 265 um, targets, uh, recently they that, they, that became the actual um, admissions, 60% of that is the economic class, which in that class would come the federal skilled workers, the ones that would go through the point system, if you're part of this, um, based on their language, education, work experience, age, if they have a relative in Canada, or if they have a job over in Canada. Um, then there's the business class, the entrepreneurs, the investors, the staff employees. Then you do have the provincial community program, and then you have the um, candidates that go directly to Quebec. So that's 60% of the 250 something admissions per year. About uh, 28 to 30% would be under the family class. And this would have been the, 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 the pie chart of <laughs> seeing the, 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 the biggest chunk. Um, the family class that would have the spouses, the partners, the, the, the children, the parents, and, and the grandparents, which would be around 28 to 30% of the admissions. And then you would have the protected persons. Um, the refugees protected persons in Canada and their dependents abroad, the government assisted refugees, the privately sponsored refugees, the visa office referred refugees. So you can see that there's a hierarchy and different sub levels and sub categories within this uh, uh, group. How much percent do you think this is? 
Oh, you must 